Hello, you're listening to Go Check Yourself. In this episode, Aaron and I are going to be discussing Chuck versus the Tic Tac. It is an episode in season three. It is actually the 10th episode of season three, to be exact. Uh, before we get into it, I just wanted to share an interesting fact that I learned about Tic Tacs. Apparently, Tic Tacs are supposed to be consumed holding the package upside down. Allegedly, the design flap is supposed to allow for only one Tic Tac to exit the box at a time. Uh, I, my entire life, have just been holding the TikTok Tic Tac box straight up and pouring some into my hand. I guess that's been inaccurate. That's been wrong. This is really maybe reassess everything I know about Tic Tacs. Uh, potentially the talk that Aaron and I have about Chuck versus the Tic Tac may reassess everything you think about the episode, or maybe not. Maybe it will re- reaffirm that all of your thoughts have been fine this entire time. And you know what? That's okay. Maybe you'll learn something. Maybe you won't. Who can say? Check out the episode. I hope you enjoy. While you're at it, make sure you follow us on Twitter at GoChuckPodcast. You can also follow us on Instagram at that same handle, at GoChuckPodcast. And if you want to get a hold of us, uh, send us an email. You can do that at GoChuckYourselfPodcast at gmail.com. I hope you enjoy this episode. I hope that your breath smells great. I'm sure it does. Here we go. Greetings, Nerd Herd Nation. You are listening to Go Chuck Yourself. That's right. There's another episode and you are listening to it. My name, hello, is Chris Gillespie. And this week I'm joined by a very special guest. Super enthused to have her here. Please give it up for the one, the only, Erin Arata. Oh, when you started, I was like, are you talking about me? Is there like someone else here? Erin, you're here. You're America's sweetheart. It's the season of Erin. Hashtag I'm a special of guest star. You're a special guest star. Whether special or not that's appearances a, by Aaron Arata. Is that a promotion or a demotion? You be the judge. It's unclear. <laughs> uh, thank you for listening. In this episode, we're going to be talking about season three, episode 10, Chuck versus the Tic Tac. We're squarely in the second half of season three. Can you believe it? That's insane. It's wild. Yeah. We're, season three is taking a turn. It's been a, a wild ride. Uh, the... The star of this episode might be the Tic Tac, but this is a a whale of an episode. This is <laughs> I thought the last episode was a, a big deal, but this episode is even maybe even a bigger deal in terms yeah, of. No, this is this is huge. This is yeah. e- may, even bigger than uh, Chuck versus the Sensei from that was season two, right? Oh, yeah. My volume is going up and down and doing all crazy things. Oh, that's. That's great. That's what you love to happen while you're in the middle of recording. <laughs> yes, it was uh, <laughs> it was peaking and then going to mute. So it got very loud and then silent and then very oh. loud and then silent. Very good. Is it fixed now? No, I think I'm OK. I'm just not going to okay. touch it. Good. Uh, the it is like Chuck versus the sensei. Yeah, very it's similar. Like a, it's a Casey episode. It's very big for revelations of Casey's past. Yes. And we're we're just chiseling away at the, the the hard rocky exterior of John Casey. We're learning more about what makes him tick. Mm-hmm. And you may remember that the previous episode ended on a cliffhanger. Someone who Casey had not heard from in a while gave him a little ring on a little ring phone. Mm-hmm. And uh, now we're going to find out who that was and what they want. And the episode before that, they uh, Chuck learned the name Alex Coburn from one of the the mobsters and Chuck versus the fake name. And he was like, mm-hmm. who's Alex Coburn? And Casey's like, don't say that name to me. Uh, so we're going to get into that in just a moment. But before we do that, we wanted to take a moment and uh, discuss a, a a question that was posed to us. I guess was it posed to us if we're included in the tweet or was it yeah, just no, an it open question? Posed. Yeah, or, it's a, it, the people want to know and we okay. are the ones to answer it. OK, so we, we got a tweet. Uh, at Go Chuck Podcast as our Twitter. Make sure you follow and tweet at us if you'd like. Uh, Ask some questions. We'll answer them. From our from our dear friend iReactions at iReactions uh, listener of the show. You, I don't think you need the at when you're talking about Twitter. No? How, you, I mean, how do, do I do this? What? <laughs> <laughs> how do I send a tweet? What's the What's the address that I address the tweet to? Do I need to have my landline plugged in so that I can send tweet? 
<laughs> Hold on, let me get my dial up going. <laughs> I don't know what that was. And, <laughs> yeah, what, what did your dial up sound like? <laughs> uh, anyhow, the question uh, from listener of the show, longtime listener, a fan of our program. Every time we see the buy more exterior in Chuck, the same car is parking in the lot. Do you ever wonder why that poor driver seems trapped in his vehicle? Unable to pull into his spot, living in that car season after season. <laughs> I do now. I it is is it always it must be the same establishing shot every time of the buy more. It's like it's seriously insane, and it's not something that I've ever noticed about Chuck. It's something that I have noticed in other shows. Um, mm-hmm. like specifically if it's like like I guess actually in this episode, I feel like establishing shots were popping up to me. So it's fun that we got this tweet um, so close to watching it. But I feel like in other shows, it's usually it usually comes up for me when it's a shot of something that I know that they could not have easily gotten multiple shots of. For example, in The Crown, like I know they can't be filming Buckingham Palace all the time. So like I assume that it's like I start to notice that it must be the same the same shot logistically. Mm-hmm. There's another show that like takes place in a New York skyscraper and it's always the same shot of like the camera turning up and pointing at that skyscraper. Um, I never really noticed it in Chuck, but like now now I definitely am. So the buy more is computer generated that that establishing shot or it's a shot of an actual building that they modified to look like so more there's like a helicopter shot like right at the beginning of this episode that i actually made note of in my notes because you see the plaza and you can see like the buy more logo which i assume either they like maybe maybe they like put it up on the building for like this one like one or yeah. two or three shots Or it's like digital. But I did notice that in the plaza, which I am assuming is a real plaza in Burbank or somewhere in L.A., there's a um, a Ralph's, which is an L.A. grocery store chain. And also right next to the Buy More is a Home Depot. Oh, really? Yeah. You saw all this in this episode? Yeah, I did. And I recognized like the logos and it was in that plaza. So like whatever the Buy More is in actuality, it seems to be like a real or at least for that shot, it was a real place. So if it's the same car that's pulling in time after time, uh-huh. is it? And we often see the the establishing shot of the buy more before we sometimes before we go to the buy more for like the first buy more scene of an episode. Yes. Uh huh. This is a stupid question, but it's not Chuck's car, is it? Chuck doesn't have a car, right? How does he get to work? Morgan rides his bike, but how does Chuck get there? But even then, think- Morgan, don't they carpool? They have I a nerd Chuck herder car. Rides Chuck drives the nerd herder, right? I guess so. We haven't really seen it. And those park in the back, so that it can't be Chuck. No. Okay. It's a very loyal customer. Or is it Big Mike? We know that Big Mike has a car. We've seen Big him Mike park does it have a car, but I feel like why would Big Mike be parking like in the front of the store? Like, isn't there like an employee parking section? But then again, like Big Mike might kind of bend the rules for convenience's uh-huh. sake. We do know that about him. He does. Yeah. I don't think I don't think that it's one of our cast members. I think it's like. It's you think it's a loyal is, customer? Yes, I think someone, maybe, maybe it's the ring. Maybe it's some, like, some poor person, like, because we know that they know that the buy more is, is some, like, there's activity there, there's, like, chatter there. So mm-hmm. it's, like, someone, someone who, like, is, is stuck there and has to, like, has to surveil things. Do you know who it is? You know who it is? It is the owner of the spy shop. The spy shop is oh. run out of that car. <laughs> he's the spy shop is like a is run out of the car so it's like a food truck but it's a car yes. that sells spy equipment yes. that sounds really illegal and not like an actual business <laughs> he, he fills out taxes <laughs> okay well that's fine all right guess, we cracked it <laughs> as long as he can give his employees w-2s i guess it doesn't really make a difference so uh, <laughs> i reactions that is uh we hope you're happy with the answer to that question and we're gonna get to we're going to answer a lot more questions as we talk about and Chuck some you didn't even ask. the Tic Tac. You don't want this. <laughs> I have a question about Tic Tacs. What is your Please. favorite kind of Tic Tac? Oh, my God. I've never had a Tic Tac. I, why did I think you were going to say that? <laughs> I was <laughs> before I was like, I'm going to ask Aaron about the Tic Tacs. I'm like, why? There's a possibility that Aaron will be like, I wasn't allowed to have Tic Tacs or like, I don't know, I don't I know what Tic Tacs are. That's not like 
Like I've never had gum either. I think what? I, like I don't You've like. Never had gum. I mean, like I've had. I think like twice in my life, and I spit it out immediately. I don't like. I used to have sour sour Altoids. Like there was a brief time uh-huh. when I would have that. Um, okay. but I don't. I'm not really into like the breath mint stuff. I just no. have horrible breath at all times. <laughs> Which is actually, that's why we started doing this podcast remotely. It was not yeah. because Aaron moved to L.A. <laughs> that was just an excuse we made up to. Yeah. Because I was like, I can't do this. I can't be recording <laughs> in person with you for hours on end. I can't do it anymore. What is uh, your favorite kind of Tic Tac? Orange. I was going to say orange, but you okay. can't connect with that because. You... No, I can't. <laughs> what is what's like the standard flavor, like mint? Yeah, it's white. It's like the okay. white mint one. But I like the orange one. I want to say that I made something one time, like, like I baked something where there were Tic Tacs involved. Like it was like not like in the baking, but oh, it was like I okay. was decorating something and it was like, say, yeah. like a pig. I put eyes and they were Tic Tacs. Uh-huh. I want to say idea. that's that's the only time I've ever like associated with Tic Tacs, but I didn't eat one. Hmm. So I would say that you are a Tic Tac and I am a Tic Tac because I'm cool <laughs> and hip. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just a Tic Tac living in a Tic Tac world. That's a good. I want that on a shirt now. All right, I'll make it happen. Um, so we've been doing a little bit of talk about like the the future of Chuck and whether there will be another like whether there'll be another reunion, whether there'll be like a movie or like something. I feel like maybe Chuck versus the Tic Tac. Is that something? They're gonna maybe do Chuck, it. Maybe the reunion is just on Tic Tac. Uh, I don't know. Don't don't even put that out into the universe because that could happen. and It would just be terrible. Yeah, it could. All right. So, <laughs> so this episode that actually exists um, starts in Honduras in 1989. As all good things do. Yeah. Um, there's a young soldier whose name is Alex Coburn, and he's told by his commanding officer that he hasn't qualified for special ops training and he's going to be sent home. As he heads back to his tent, some other commanding officer type guy calls him over and offers him a box of Tic Tacs. The guy tells Alex that there's an even more special, more secret black ops team of snipers and whatever that wants Alex to join them. He implies that to do this, Alex will have to give up his whole life, his name, his family, etc. But he'll be able to become the soldier he always dreamed he would. Alex says this would be a dream come true. How so? He wasn't qualified enough to join the main special ops uh, well, team, but I he's think, qualified enough. I think enough. that they they wouldn't let him do that because they wanted him for this other thing. Like that was that was how I interpreted that. Oh, okay. Like they were like, you didn't make it, but actually he did make it. He was just so good that he was going to be in a more secret thing. So we cut from this scene to Casey in the same sort of like positioning as Alex talking to the same man. It's also apparently the guy who called Casey at the end of the last episode. Everything is coming together. So this man who we find out later is named Keller tells Casey that Beckman is about to assign the Chuck team a mission. And while Casey is on that mission, Keller wants him to do a little side mission. Keller tells Casey he knows he'll make the right decision. So we know that Casey is Alex Coburn. (gasps) We move outside to see that Morgan is spying on Casey using some spy equipment he probably bought from that car outside of the Biomore. Chuck catches him in the act, and Morgan says he thinks Casey is getting a mission. Chuck is confused about what the mission might be and who the elderly gentleman is, because if Casey's getting a mission, Chuck should be getting one too. At this point, we see the aerial shot that I noted before. We, we see a Home Depot and a Ralph's. Um, but we uh, we use that aerial to transition into Castle, where Beckman assigns the team a trace cell mission, just like Keller said. Apparently, this means that Sarah, Casey, and Chuck are breaking into a CIA facility to test its security. Casey, like me, wonders if Shaw will be joining them, and Beckman really snottily says, no, he's in D.C., as if, like, Casey should know that. I mean, maybe he should. Maybe, like, Casey should have been more observant that, like, Shaw isn't there in Castle with them, but I don't know. She seemed a little unnecessarily snotty. She then adds that Sarah will be catching a later flight to meet him. We learn in a second that it's a personal trip, so I'm like, why Why did Beckman know that? Why did she, like, <laughs> add that as part of their mission briefing? I don't really know. Um, the only reason that I can think of for her to say that is because it prompts Chuck to say, does everyone have a secret mission within a mission? And Casey is like, ah... Uh, 
Yeah, Beckman's like Beckman hasn't been here the past few weeks, and yeah, then they're she, like, "Where's Shaw?" And she's like, "Shaw's not there." And we're like, "Well, he's been here, and now you're, yeah. we don't know what's going on." Yeah, on the mission, Chuck flashes in order to flip through a booby trapped hallway where the booby trap looks kind of like jets of air shooting out of the wall, but I assume it's like knives or darts or something. Mm-hmm. Do you know what's going on here? Yeah, it looked like it was some kind of bullets. Okay. So once they get up 15 floors of like that kind of booby trap stuff, Chuck opens a lockbox and finds a note from Beckman that says job well done. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, Casey sneaks away to take something out of another lockbox. Unfortunately Mm. for him, Chuck catches him in the act. When Chuck asks about it, Casey pulls a gun on him and says he'll kill Chuck if he tells anyone about this. Chuck is like, what? But when Mm. Sarah comes in, Chuck does not tell her. After the credits, Devin pays Chuck a little visit in his apartment and says that Ellie has tentatively agreed to Doctors Without Borders, but now she seems to be waffling a little bit. Devin asks Chuck to try to reassure Ellie. Then there's a knock on the door, so Devin rushes to the Morgan door just as Ellie comes in. She tells Chuck she got into a neurology fellowship at USC, which is pretty awesome. Congratulations, Ellie. She doesn't know what to do because that's her dream, but Africa seems to be Devin's dream. Chuck isn't sure what to say, but he's saved by the bell when Casey texts him to come to Castle immediately and keep his mouth shut. Casey, you shouldn't you shouldn't be texting about these things. Like, it can't be <laughs> secret if there's a phone record. The next scene literally made me want to crawl out of my skin. I was so <laughs> uncomfortable. Beckman tells the team that there's a special combat drug that was stolen from the vault our team just broke into, and they suspect it was an inside job. In a very Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone type moment, Chuck remembers that he was there and he saw that vault emptied that day by Casey. He thinks it's some type of test on whether or not he'll turn in a teammate, so he tells Beckman that Casey took the pill. But it's not a test. Sarah pulls her gun on Casey and Beckman tells Sarah to lock him up. Sarah and Chuck beg Casey to explain, but he doesn't. This was very intense. It was. It st- it took a very weird turn. I did not see that coming. I thought this episode yeah. was going to be about Chuck struggling to keep yeah. Casey's secret or to nope. try to, like, confront Casey while also keeping his secret and going behind Sarah's back or whatever. But no, just in the first 10 minutes, Chuck just goes yeah. out and just reveals the thing that Casey not told him, do not reveal this. And Chuck yeah. did it. And it was like you said, it was very uncomfortable. It was it was very well done. Don't uh, don't tell Chuck your secrets, I guess. I guess not. There's one other thing I should mention here. This combat drug, which does have a name, but I didn't bother writing it down. Um, It apparently eliminates all emotions from soldiers. Chuck is intrigued by this because it might help him with flashing, but Sarah reminds him that with this drug, he will feel nothing. It's not just like fear or like, it's just like, it makes you emotionless. But just temporarily, right? It wouldn't just be like you take it once and it changes you. We'll we'll talk about that more later, I guess. Uh, Okay. So at the buy more, Chuck grabs Morgan and asks him for the footage he recorded of Casey's secret meeting. Morgan is all too happy to be involved, and he shows Chuck a video, which causes Chuck to flash on a Colonel Keller, who was dishonorably discharged from the military, apparently for working for the ring. I don't I don't know exactly. Uh, Morgan says he wants in on whatever Chuck's discovered, but Chuck says it's better for Morgan to stay far away from this one. Chuck is obviously scared. While a team of agents goes through Casey's apartment and destroys his bonsai tree, Chuck pulls Sarah aside and tells her about his flash. He thinks Casey is being played by his former commanding officer, who it turns out turned Casey's sensei and is now working for the ring. Sarah warns him that they won't be able to talk to Casey easily since he committed treason and he's going to be transferred to a site outside torture jurisdictions on the next day. She asks Chuck if he's sure he wants to risk everything, including his future as a real spy, and he says, it's Casey. She says, I was hoping you'd say that. And I think this is, like, a nice moment of growth, because, like, I don't I don't know exactly what it means, and I feel like Sarah should be more pissed about this, but, like, we see that at the beginning of the season, like, Chuck wasn't willing to give up his future as a real spy for Sarah, but now he is willing to give that up for Casey. So I think mm-hmm. that's, like, growth, but I also think Sarah should be, like, a little bit hurt by that. <laughs> but Sarah wants to do this too. She wants to save yeah. Casey, so she's glad yeah. to have Chuck on board. Yes, and she's also happy that he hasn't completely changed and given himself over. He's still willing to stand up for his friends. Mm-hmm. 
So they break back into the CIA facility. Chuck tries to do his flashy, flippy thing under the assumption that the security measures are still the same the next day, but he crashes into a plastic wall that was inserted in the middle of the hallway. An alarm goes off and an elevator opens behind Chuck and Sarah. A man comes out. His name is uh, Stanley Fitzroy, son (laughs) son of the king. And um, he says, I see you encountered my new security measures. And it's kind of an oh shit moment until Sarah starts to applaud. And I I also want, I just want to say here that um, I thought for the briefest of seconds, I thought this was Scooter. And I really, I really wish it was. I thought he was just going to come out of the elevator. Yeah, well, like for like the briefest of seconds, there was like a like relatively short man with glasses, like looking kind of like. Like he he knows what he's doing, and I was like, oh, "It's Scooter! This is the revelation we've been waiting for." But it's I mean, it's not. But it was very exciting for me. I don't picture Scooter as a short man with glasses. I picture Scooter as a very tall man with glasses. He looms large in our hearts. <laughs> uh, we learn that Stanley is the person who's in charge of modifying the security systems, and uh, he tells his guards that they need to report Chuck and Sarah. But then Sarah, as Aaron says, starts to applaud. And uh, says and she starts to pretend like they're supposed to be there to test the new security changes. Chuck then takes out his phone to further sell the bit and pretends to call Beckman. Stanley falls for all this and becomes vulnerable when Chuck pretends to speak highly of him to Beckman. Stanley then calls off the security guards and apologizes for the confrontation. He didn't know Sarah and Chuck were coming. Stanley then asks if he if uh, Chuck likes what he did with level one security and they say that they did. And they'd love to see what he did on level 15. And Stanley immediately offers to take them up there and give them a tour. There's also this weird exchange where Stanley explains the etymology of his name being Fitzroy, being son of a king. And a king. Sarah and Chuck pretend to be interested in that. Uh, elsewhere, in Ellie and Devin's apartment, Ellie and Devin have a heated conversation about whether to stay in L.A. or to go to Doctors Without Borders while riding their stationary bikes which are face to face in the living room which yeah, is cool. pretty intense time do you is that how you have your stationary bike set up yeah exactly yeah yeah uh they both try to use chuck's endorsement as evidence that they're they're right but when both of them end up having chuck's endorsement they realize that they need to go see chuck again to see what he thinks and i'm watching this i'm like oh, i know how this scene ends they go to chuck and then they end up cutting the baby in half <laughs> oh god Ellie and Devin run out to Chuck's apartment, but Morgan answers the door. They decide that Morgan is sufficient enough, so they start to unload their conflict onto Morgan. After they simultaneously each say their piece, Morgan tells Devin that he's being selfish. Devin pulls Morgan aside for a sidebar and tells him that if Morgan knew everything that Devin did, he'd know that it's not safe for them in L.A., to which Morgan counters by saying that if Devin knew all the information that Morgan does, he'd realize that their apartment is, in fact, the safest place for them to be. Morgan and Devin then go back and forth about Chuck's job, each alluding that they know more than the other person. And then it turns out that they uh, they both know that Chuck is a spy. Devin admits to having known this for a while, and the two celebrate how cool it is, but then Devin points out that now Morgan should understand how much danger Ellie is in each time Devin goes on a mission. And Morgan's like, you've been going on missions? And Devin's like, yeah. And so Morgan's a little bothered by that, but then joins Devin's cause. I thought he was going to be more bothered. Yeah, you'd think he'd be more upset about it, especially because yeah. he's... That's sort of a thing in this episode is a thread that Morgan wants to be involved with the missions. Yeah. But but it's I, like less. I mean, I I like this, but it's less that Morgan feels like betrayed and inadequate. And it's more just like he's like, yeah, that makes me want to do it even more. Like mm-hmm. he's he's pretty supportive of Devin, which I liked. Like when Morgan's like whiny, it's like more annoying. But like mm-hmm. this was just kind of like endearing. He was like, yeah, dude, you went on a mission. I want to do that. Yeah. I mean, I also would think that if you're interacting with Captain Awesome, you'd be like, yeah, of course, you've been on missions and I have yeah. not been. I mean, you know? yes, of course. So in addition to the, I mean, Casey seemingly defecting to the ring, which we at this point don't know if it's going to be a major change or just a, a single change in this episode. But this revelation that Morgan and Devin are now communicating that they both know that Chuck is a spy is a major plot point that's going to continue for the rest of the show. Like this is just a one of this episode's many revelations that are going to carry out forward. I think, you know, this is a, a big bombshell in my opinion. Anyhow, the two, uh, the two of them, Morgan and Devin return to Ellie who's standing outside and Morgan tells her that the children of LA don't need her help, but the people overseas do. And Evie, uh, 
Ellie is miffed that Morgan is now on Devin's side. Back in the CIA base, Chuck and Sarah and Stanley arrive at level 15. Stanley reveals that he's Chuck's biggest fan, which get in line, buddy. <laughs> Turns out Stanley files all of the gang's mission reports. He asks Chuck if he remembers the time that he kissed Casey to try to cure him from the bioweapon. I and do. Chuck, I do as well. Chuck brushes it off in front of Sarah, but tells Stanley that they can talk about it later. Chuck asks how Stanley secured the holding cell where Casey is being held, and Stanley reveals a fancy blue key card. Sarah tells Stanley that they need the key card. Concerned, Stanley says that he will swallow the key card if he has to. As Stanley <laughs> slowly raises the key card to his mouth, the alarm starts to go off, and Sarah decides that they don't have time for this. Sarah don't give a shit, so she rips the key card from Stanley's hand and punches him in the face. <laughs> Chuck asks if that was completely necessary, and Sarah says yes. They then use the keycard to deactivate the alarm and access the security footage of the cell where Casey is being held. Casey seems to be fine, but then there's an explosion in his cell. Sarah and Chuck run over to Casey and find that Keller and his team have blown a hole in Casey's wall. Casey is stunned and could either go with Keller or he could go with Chuck and Sarah. Chuck tells Casey that Keller is not who he seems. He's with the ring. Casey says, I know, and then hobbles away with Keller and his team, leaving Chuck stunned. As Chuck and Sarah exit the CIA base, they try to make sense of Casey joining the ring when they are apprehended by some secret agents in a van who put black bags over their heads and bring them back to Castle. Not really sure why they needed to put bags over their heads to bring them to a place they already know how to get to, but okay. It's a, a good point. I think it was just like, just for the, the drama, like Beckman wanted them to like know that they fucked up. Right, and to be kind of emotionally rattled. Yes, Yeah. exactly. We cracked it. Beckman's all about that. That psychological torture. <laughs> yeah, he is. <laughs> when the bags are removed, we see that Beckman herself is actually standing in Castle in person. You know it's bad when Beckman shows up in person. Beckman's pissed and says that when three of her agents are arrested for treason within 24 hours, it reflects poorly on her. Chuck tries to explain, but Beckman says that they don't know Casey as well as they think they do. She proceeds to explain that his real name was Alex Coburn and that Alex Coburn staged his own death the same day that someone named John Casey joined Keller's NSA Black Ops team. It seems that Keller has recruited Casey once again. Beckman then tells Sarah and Chuck that the only reason they are not in federal prison right now is that she needs them to bring Casey in from the ring, dead or alive. We cut to an overhead shot of Chuck Morgan and Ellie in Devin's apartment complex. It's another establishing shot. I never realized how large of a building it is. It's like, huge. It's massive, the apartment, and it's crazy that we never see any other neighbors of any kind mulling about. <laughs> And the the first I like that they didn't even do that in the first season or the second season. There's just no other neighbors, which I nope. find to be a little bizarre. Anyway, Morgan is arriving home from work and encounters a rather hostile gardener, which would be a good name for a band. Yeah, we'll add that to the list if we were doing that this episode. The gardener turns out to be Casey in disguise. Casey tells Morgan not to tell anyone that he's there. And Morgan asks if it's a secret mission to which Casey says yes and then asks Morgan if he wants to be a part of it. Morgan agrees under the condition that he can get a cool code name like Ladyfingers, and Casey reluctantly agrees. Back at Castle, Chuck and Sarah assemble their gear and try to process why Casey defected to the ring after three years of friendship and working together. Sarah says that people change in the spy world and you ultimately don't know who you can trust at any given point. There's a pause and then Sarah says, I thought you had changed, to which Chuck says, what do you mean? Sarah then says she knows that Chuck wants to be the perfect spy and all that he sacrificed to get there but she asks him not to lose the guy that she met three years ago and to, quote, not give up on the things that make him great. Sarah offers Chuck a gun and Chuck turns it away, saying, I'll always be that guy. Pulling out the heartstrings here. It was nice. Chuck then tries to open up more to Sarah, but Sarah shoots him down and says that they should really focus on the mission, which seems kind of unfair. Like Sarah got to talk a little bit. You think that she'd be like, yeah, Chuck, you can talk, too. But no, <laughs> they're going back no. to work. Sarah and Chuck realize that the only reason that Keller would have gone through all of the trouble of breaking Casey out of the CIA holding cell would be because Casey or Keller, sorry, still doesn't have the top secret pill, which means if they can get to Casey in time, they can rescue the combat drug. They try to figure out where Casey could have hidden the, uh, the laudanol, which is the name of the combat drug. You wrote it down. <laughs> I did not write it down, but I looked it up after the fact. Oh, good. So there wasn't anything in Casey's apartment, so they don't know where he could have hidden it. Chuck suggests that he could have hid it in the buy more, but Sarah says that Casey would be too smart to hide something in the buy more. At this point, with all of its security cameras, Chuck sees Morgan. Uh, he's watching the security feed in the Bymore, and he sees Morgan awkwardly enter the store through the security feed and suggests that perhaps Casey is taking advantage of someone who is clueless and desperate to impress a spy. 
Sure enough, Morgan, looking awfully suspicious, heads over to the DVD aisle where none of the DVDs are shrink-wrapped. Oh, I brought that too. <laughs> Just walk up and take a DVD. Yeah. He open, Morgan opens up a copy of the original Planet of the Apes movie and finds the pill hidden inside. Chuck approaches Morgan in the Buy More and asks him what he's doing with the original Planet of the Apes movie since he hates it because <laughs> all, none of the eight people's upper lips move <laughs> in the movie, which is a, a valid critique. I've found that to be unsettling in the past when I've encountered the movie on TV. Morgan lies and pretends it's nothing, but Chuck presses him and asks if Casey sent him to get something perhaps something hidden in that DVD case. Morgan eventually relents and says that Casey said that he couldn't tell anyone about the mission, but Chuck says that if Morgan gives him the DVD case, he will answer any and all questions that Morgan have about his mission. Morgan seems interested in this and hands Chuck the DVD case. I have two comments about this. One is that while they are talking in the background, someone walks by with a huge box, which mm -hmm. seems to be called a Robo Raptor. What? Somebody walks by with a, roto a Robo Raptor. Okay. Those you remember those like big toy robot dinosaurs? Yeah, I think that's what it was. It was yeah. very cool. I want one. And then <laughs> the other thing. So during this scene and potentially other scenes, there's like monkeys playing mm -hmm. on the buy more TVs. And I don't think that was Planet of the Apes. It just seemed to be like nature documentaries. So yeah. what do you think is like what do you think is going on here with all the monkey things? I don't know. They It seemed to me that they used to have. Like what was showing on the Buy More TVs used to connect to the yeah. theme of the episode. Well, I was I, wondering if this connected, but I was just like too blind to see it, you know? I don't think so. I was just thinking that it was like they couldn't show Planet of the Apes, maybe, or okay. something like tangential to Planet of the Apes. OK, that makes sense. What did you so because Morgan asks, he says that he wants to hear about all of Chuck's mission and ask all of the questions that he has. Uh -huh. Which of Chuck's past missions do you think Morgan would be the most interested to hear about? Well, I think he'd be pretty interested in the like the Jeff thing because he knows Jeff, like mm -hmm. the the Tom Sawyer. And that involved like the like pseudo Nintendo inventor guy. So I think mm -hmm. there's that. Yeah, I think um, learning about Ted Rourke would probably be pretty interesting to Morgan. Mm -hmm. um, oh, anything with um, the what what's your name that Morgan slept with? Um, Sarah's yes. friend. Yeah. What? The, uh, the Swedish model. Yeah. What's her? What's her name? Katrina mm -hmm. um, or Karina. I think it's Karina. Right. Um, so I, I, those are my picks. What about, what do you think? Yeah, no, I think those are all good. I think he's gonna, I wasn't really thinking of it from an angle of missions that are connected to Morgan or things that well, he'd understand. you know, Morgan, I feel like Morgan would be interested in things that are, I'm not saying he's selfish, but I'm not, not saying No, it would selfish. be, it would be the most interested to hear about like, oh, well, you think you know these people or this thing? Yeah. This is how it actually is. I think that's yeah. probably the most interesting. Chuck returns to his apartment. And cautiously enters. When he shuts the door, we see that Casey was hiding in the shadows. Casey asks Chuck where Morgan is and admits that he knew he probably couldn't rely on Morgan. Casey then aims his gun at Chuck and demands that Chuck tell him where the DVD case is. Chuck is paralyzed with fear and then sees Sarah sneaking in through the patio door behind Casey with her gun drawn. Chuck then decides to pull on Casey's emotions and say that he's always believed in Casey. And Casey responds by pointing his gun closer to Chuck's chest. Chuck says that he knows everything about Alex Coburn and what Casey is currently doing for Keller, but admits that he doesn't know why Casey is doing it. Casey's finger gets awfully close to his trigger, but then he puts his gun down and turns around and sees Sarah. Casey says that Alex Coburn had a fiance who now thinks he's dead. And if he doesn't return the laudanol to the ring, the ring is going to kill her. Ah. What? He had a fiance. No. Crazy. We then see a photo booth photo of a young Alex Coburn and a young woman named Kathleen. Casey says that she was the love of his life and that he gave her up to serve his country. And now he's concerned that she's going to die because of the choice that he made all those years ago. Sarah says that they won't let that happen. But Casey says that the ring is going to kill Kathleen if he doesn't tell them the location of the lot and all within the hour. Sarah and Chuck offer to go rescue Kathleen since Casey has to go meet Keller. But Casey says that they could be tried for treason. And Chuck says that he doesn't care. He knows who Casey is, and he wants Casey to know that he's not alone in this problem. Cut to Casey arriving at his meeting with the ring in a large black SUV. I guess his fixation with Crown Royales is over. Casey <laughs> exits the vehicle smoking a cigar, which I was hoping he'd say was Costa Gravin, but apparently it's a Cuban cigar. So it's disappointing. Cuba and Costa Gravas both exist in the Chuck universe. I thought Costa Gravas was supposed to be the replacement for Cuba. I have no idea. I don't know. It's It's unclear. Our ring henchman pats Casey down and Casey says that he's alone. He just has a cigar. 
He then lights his cigar and drops his matchbox on the ground matchbox on the ground with five of the matches facing up. Meanwhile, Chuck is sneaking around some pleasant suburban neighborhood disguised as an employee of a utility company. He knocks on Kathleen's door and says that he was there to read her meter, but notice that there's likely a gas leak inside her house. and She needs to leave immediately. Kathleen follows Chuck immediately outside. But as they walk away from her house, Chuck sees the ring pull up outside on the street and insists that they go back into the house. Kathleen does not want to do this, but Chuck says that she needs to forget what he said and that the gas leak is actually outside and they need to get back inside. Once inside, Kathleen suspects that something fishy is going on and asks Chuck who he really is. Chuck tells her that he's not crazy and then pushes her into a coat closet to hide her. He bars the coat closet shut with a chair, which I'm sure won't give away her location to the (laughs) ring at all. Back at Casey's meeting with the ring, Casey enters a log cabin and finds Keller, who is sitting at a desk by himself. I guess that's where you, I don't know if it's an Airbnb or just he's just been renting this log cabin while he's been working in the area. Yeah, why not? He needs he needs somewhere that he can relax and sit at a desk by himself. Also, speaking of people in the area, is isn't it convenient that Kathleen lives in literally I have this note. (laughs) I was like, so I was assuming that it was like. Sarah also grew up in a in the LA area and uh-huh. Casey also grew up in the LA area. Like that was my assumption. Um or Kathleen just moved to the LA area. Like I feel like Casey has like a more midwestern vibe. But yeah, it's pretty convenient that they both like everyone on this show like grew up and lives now in the LA area. And yeah, I got deployed to. Well, didn't Sarah Well, she was like when she was a young girl, they had that scene in Montana. Right. Oh, yes. Yes. But then they she went to Montana, high school. But she went in to California. high school in like San the, Diego. Yeah. It was unclear where Casey actually lived, but I'm assuming LA area. Or where Alex Coburn lived. Dun, oh, dun, you're dun. right. Ooh. Uh, so, yeah, Casey's in this log cabin, and uh, Keller asks him if he has the Laudanol, and Casey silently tosses the case that he originally found the Laudanol in to Keller. Keller says that he knew he could count on Casey and tells him that Casey wouldn't be in this mess if he just stopped caring about Kathleen. Keller opens the case up and finds a single Tic Tac, which is something that Aaron's never put in her mouth, I guess. He asks why there's a Tic Tac there, and Casey says, your breath stinks. Keller is disappointed and says that the one thing that he taught Casey was to always have someone watching your back, and Casey says, I know. We then cut to Sarah repelling herself from the bottom of the the SUV. Oh, that she was looks, so cool. It was really cool. She looked like Laura Croft yeah. uh, in the Tomb Raider reboots. She's just really gritty and just like covered in mud. And she sees the five matches sticking up out of the matchbook and says, it's five against one. That's a, I mean, that was a cool signal on Casey's part. It was cool. It was pretty clever. I don't know exactly what like the benefit of her knowing that there are five people is other like, I guess she can plan for that mm-hmm. or she knows she hasn't missed anybody. Right. But yeah. So Sarah fights the guys while Casey fights Keller. Sarah rushes in just as Casey snaps Keller's neck. I was I was pretty surprised. I mean, I know that these like these side villains usually like disappear within the episode, but like he brutally like just kind of like. Yeah, they aren't usually brutally murdered in the the heat of battle, but it was cool, I guess. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, if you think violence is cool, Chris. Uh, Sorry, I don't know. (laughs) Casey says he's defending his loved one. That's true. He says, they're already at the house. At said house, Chuck is disgruntled to discover that the ring guys are also posing as the gas company. I guess that's just (laughs) in vogue right now. He calls Sarah and Casey and they tell him he has to handle the next five minutes on his own while they get over there. But he can't flash. Casey tells Chuck to take the pill to eliminate fear. So Chuck does it. I thought it was going to be like, I didn't remember what happened. So I thought it was kind of going to be like a um, like that, you know, in Harry Potter, when like. Harry tricks Ron and like Ron thinks that he's taken the the luck potion, but actually he hasn't. Like I thought it was gonna be like Chuck was gonna get a tic tac a tic tac, but he would just like think he was more powerful. Mm-hmm. But actually, no, he really took this pill. The bad guys break in and knock Chuck to the ground, but when they pull Kathleen out of the coat closet and knock her out, Chuck flashes, and the fight that follows is honestly pretty badass. Yeah. He he like wrecks the bad guys and also Kathleen's house, which kind of sucked <laughs> for her. And he's strangling the last one to death when Sarah rushes in and yells at him to stop. Chuck almost doesn't. And he like turns around and kind of like looks at her unseeingly. But then like they make eye contact and he realizes what he's doing and he stops. He and Sarah are rightly horrified. Meanwhile, Casey rushes to Kathleen. He touches her face and has a flashback to calling her one last time the night he supposedly died. 
She's kind and a badass over the phone, and she tells him she has news, but before she can tell him what that is, Keller interrupts and gives Casey his new dog tags and his new name. In the present, Kathleen wakes up and asks Casey if she knows him. He helps her to the couch. Right then, a girl rushes in, shouting, Mom! Kathleen greets her and calls her Alex, which is like, <gasps> like oh, What? <laughs> Casey starts to leave, and Chuck protests, but Casey says what's dead is dead. Back in Castle, Beckman tells Casey she'll be giving him a second, second chance. Instead of sending him to jail, she's just firing him from government service, so he'll be starting over as a civilian. Once Chuck and Casey are gone, Beckman tells Sarah that if she'd still like to leave Burbank, which I guess was something that she requested to do, like, a little while ago, there's an empty seat on Beckman's flight back to D.C. Then, uh, Swim Until You Can't See Land starts playing, and I'm really useless for the rest of the episode because I was just kind of, like, dancing along. Well, um, I will take it over for a declassified scene then. Great. Uh, so back at the apartment, Devin answers his door and Morgan walks in. Morgan says that he's been thinking about he and Devin's talk before and that he decided to take a look in his Ellie box. So that's right. Morgan has an Ellie box and we're going in this direction right now. Great. Uh, Morgan says that he agrees with Devin in his effort to protect Ellie. But then Morgan hands Devin a photograph and tells him to take a look. It's a photograph of Ellie as an 11 year old girl on Halloween dressed up as a USC neurology fellow, which we know because she's wearing a name tag that says USC neurology fellow. <laughs> and then Morgan concludes by saying, I think there might be a better way, you know, questions, concerns. <laughs> that's like that's a pretty that's a pretty awesome Halloween costume. Like it's very specific, very, very specific. <laughs> I didn't know what fellowships were when I was 11. Like, I actually didn't know what fellowships were until I was, like, 21. Yep, and then all of a sudden you wake up and you're co-hosting a podcast about Chuck, and yep. that's your life. You could have been yep. a neurology fellow, but <laughs> instead have. you're doing this. Yeah. Uh, anyhow, yes, Frightened Rabbit's playing, so we know that things are going to get emotional. Ellie, um, with with that scene not having happened in the actual episode, um, Ellie and Chuck meet in the courtyard. Ellie tells Chuck she's thinking of doing Doctors Without Borders because she knows how important it is to Devin and she knows how much she wants to be with him. Then, in a bachelorette type moment, Devin comes over and asks if he can steal Ellie away. He brings her into their apartment, which is all decked out with congratulations banners. He congratulates her on her acceptance to the fellowship and tells her to take it because he knows it's her dream. So, I mean, I guess, like, I kind of, it doesn't really make sense that she was dressed as a USC neurology fellow. Um, and I also kind of like that Devin did this of his own volition, but that mm -hmm. does make sense as a, um, as a plot point. Meanwhile, Chuck goes into Casey's apartment, which is now empty because I guess the government repossessed all his furniture. That seems a little harsh. Like, <laughs> not... I understand why his gun cabinet is empty, but, like, his couch, too? Well, they probably bought it right for him, and... Uh, I mean, I guess. I feel like they could let him keep it. It's not like costing them anything. Maybe they got to stage a new apartment somewhere and they're going to reuse the furniture. I guess you're right. Casey does have a new bonsai tree, though, so that's nice. Mm. Chuck gives Casey back his photo strip of the pictures with Kathleen, which I don't really know why Chuck had that, but uh, he did and he gives it back. <laughs> um, Casey says it's too late. He gave up everything to be a spy, but it's not too late for Chuck. Casey tells Chuck that Walker is a good woman. We then cut to Sarah, who's in a taxi in D.C. with a chatty taxi driver. She tells the driver she's thinking of moving there. And that's where we end. Oh, no. Or do we? I have a declassified scene again. Oh, my God. Really? <laughs> OK, tell me. After talking to Casey, Chuck stands in the center of the courtyard. He looks into Ellie and Devin's apartment and sees them smiling and holding their champagne. And then he turns and sees Casey sitting alone, solemnly reflecting on the photos of him and Kathleen. Chuck then turns and looks straight at the courtyard gate, expecting to see Sarah, but she does not show up. And he just stands alone, heartbroken. Why did he think he was going to see her? Just because she's were, usually there. She's usually at the there. the end of episodes. Yeah. And he's just standing there and he looks really sad. Oh. And then Morgan walks out carrying a six pack and says, a promise is a promise. And says that he's going to have a lot of follow up questions before he starts his interview with Chuck about all of his spy missions. Morgan senses that something's wrong and asks Chuck if he's OK. And Chuck says that it's just Sarah stuff. And then Morgan asks his first question, which is, why don't you tell me about Sarah? That's nice. I like that. That is the extended version of Chuck versus the Tic Tac. Oh, I like that. I would. It would have been good. I was picturing because I think they would have had the 
um, if Fright and Rabbit was still playing over uh-huh. the chuckling sadly at the gate, uh-huh. I think it would have worked really well. But they had to cut that for some reason. They did. Too bad. At least you got to see it. I got to see it. It was a treat. It was very special. That's Chuck versus the Tic Tac. Lots of, like we said at the beginning, I feel like there's a lot of big stuff that happened. So we, to recap, uh, Devin and Morgan now each know that they they both know that Chuck is a spy. Uh, they know that they know. They know that they know. We know that they know. They do not know that we know that they know. No, they don't uh, know that we exist, but maybe they'll find out. Uh, <laughs> in the strangest crossover episode ever, <laughs> where it turns out we're in an episode of Chuck. Um, the Ellie and Devin are seemingly like, it seems like they're going to stay in L.A. They're not going to do Doctors Without Borders. Sarah, on the other hand, is potentially moving to D.C. to be with Shaw, which is crazy. Uh, Casey is returning to civilian life after being fired from the government. What's he going to do? Is he going to keep working at the Buy More? Is he going to try to get another job? How's that going to happen? Oh, by the way, Casey also has an ex-fiance who is still alive and lives within driving distance, as well as a... A, a uh, child. He has a child. A daughter. I mean, she's a young woman at this point, yeah. but... I f- like... It could have not been his daughter. Like they, it's an assumption. I know her name is Alex, Mm -hmm. but like Kathleen could have sought solace in the arms of another. Like we don't know how long he was gone. Like I think it's a huge assumption. Like he doesn't know. She could be like a little younger than she looks. Like he Mm -hmm. doesn't know that he's the father for sure. No, it's true. We don't know. Like I guess the assumption in that is that because her name is Alex, and I think that's a nice tribute from Kathleen, but mm. I think that people are making assumptions and we need a little bit more before we like start saying that this is definitively Casey's child. Okay. That's that's fair enough. I guess we'll And I wanna be clear. If if Kathleen slept with somebody else, had a child with somebody else, that's fine. That's good. Good on her. But I just think that we shouldn't assume that everyone is Casey's child. Some people aren't, you know? <laughs> so wait, are you telling me that Stanley is also not Casey's child? No, Stanley's Casey's child. Oh, okay. All right, good. Um, so <laughs> the the kind folks of Wikipedia, there's a someone had written on the, the Wikipedia page for this episode that uh, the revelation that John Casey didn't come into existence until 1989 appears to conflict some other details of Casey's past that we know, notably his actions against Premier Alejandro Goya uh, in Chuck versus the Angel of Death. So uh, I don't know. Did we know that Casey was doing was fighting the Costa Gravens in the 80s or did he start doing that in the 90s? I feel like they did say the 80s, but yeah, I, I feel like they did, too. Yeah. OK, so um, that doesn't make a ton of sense. But then they also say that Casey is seen speaking to his mother and calling him by the name, calling himself by the name Johnny Boy in Chuck versus the uh, Santa Claus. I do remember that. But I think and we talked about this when we watched that episode was that we neither of us were convinced that he was actually talking to his mother. We thought yeah. that he was doing like a code name thing. Yeah. So I think that justifies that. Yeah. But the, the Coast of Gravin thing is a little tricky to. Yeah. To reconcile. Um, also, while I'm looking at this, apparently the number of the locker that Casey opens in the CIA base to uh, to retrieve the lot and all was 092407, which is the date the show premiered. September oh, 24th, nice. 2007. Yeah. Um, I'm thinking, does does Casey's age line up? How old do you think Alex Coburn was in the beginning of the episode? When he just at the beginning of the episode in 1989? Yeah. I don't know. He looked like he was in his like early to mid 20s. OK, yeah, I guess I, I guess that lines up. Were you I thought it was fine that they had different actors playing the younger versions of Casey and Kathleen. Yeah, that's fine. I always like when that happens. Okay. I didn't know if it would throw you off. You're like, why no, would it I... looked it would have looked so weird if they had like a- Adam Baldwin like playing. <laughs> yeah, if they like de-aged him or made him a little bit more youthful. Like, yeah, like they yeah. did with Sarah. They just gave him braces. <laughs> or they gave him like one of those caps with like the little propellers on top. Yeah, he's <laughs> a kid him, now. He's young. They gave him a big lollipop. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so a segment that we do is Chuck, Mary kill, uh, where we identify one element of this episode that we'd like to marry because we liked it. Oh, maybe we'll end up faking our own deaths. So we don't actually have to marry this and end up joining a, joining an NSA black ops project. And we'll find out. And then, uh, the other component of this is the kill section, which maybe we will strangle the death, like the Colonel Keller in the log cabin, like Casey, but that's part of the episode that we don't like. 
So my Mary, I'm. Th- it's one of these rare instances in which it is a person. I'm going to marry Stanley Fitzroy. Nice. I'm going to become Aaron Fitzroy. Oh, congratulations! That's exciting. Yeah, I I really liked him as a character. I thought he was he was very funny. Um, I thought that I I liked that he was funny and yet smart. Like I liked that he is tricked by Sarah and Chuck's like re- reasonable plan. Um, but then also like once they ask him for the key card, like he immediately gets it. Like he's like, oh, I was tricked. And I like that he's willing to swallow a uh, the the key card for his country. Mm-hmm. Good for you, Stanley. I look forward to being your wife. Well, <laughs> wife of son of the king. Yes. I so I'll just go into my kill then because my kill was give us more Stanley. Yeah. I was hoping that he was going to play a bigger role throughout. Oh, the episode. me too. That would have been nice. He was a an interesting little character. I thought yeah. what was going to happen was that he was going to somehow end up with the lot and all. And because he seems to have a proclivity for swallowing things to hide them, I thought that he was going to try hiding the laudanol in his stomach and not know what it is and then turn Uh into a super soldier. Oh, that would have been cool. That's a good that's a good idea. Thank you. We're opposite. So now you have to do your kill and I will do my Mary. Okay, um, my kill, I thought the logistics of the drug were a little confusing. Mm -hmm. I wasn't clear on if you take it once and you immediately become a super soldier or if it's like a repeated thing that you like take it because it didn't seem like it lasted on Chuck for very long. No, no. Um, So I don't know like how useful that would be in actual battle um, if it only lasts for like a minute. Um, And then I thought that the title of the episode, I didn't think like Tic Tacs were that important. Um, so I feel like, I mean, they already used, uh, Chuck versus the fake name, but I feel like they could have done a little bit better on this title. Well, I was thinking that the Tic Tac also kind of applies to the Laudanol pill. Ah, uh, like yeah, nickname I guess you're it. right. Sure. Okay. <laughs> uh, point Chris. Yes. Uh, so I have to do my Mary. I was just going to say that, like, I like how we get to see. Casey being a little bit more vulnerable this episode. Uh-huh. We got to learn about his backstory. I was ready for the episode's twist to be that Casey was going deep undercover to t- take out Keller and like uh-huh. trick Keller into thinking that he was, but he would be a double agent. But uh-huh. I'm glad that they went in a different direction and that Casey was motivated by all this other different stuff. And yeah. that he's got a new, a new challenge ahead of him and whether or not he's going to connect with his potential daughter or not. Yeah, that's great. I like uh, ending on a positive note as well. Yeah, it's good. Except for it wasn't a positive note for Chuck because he was sad that Sarah was in. Oh, I mean, I just eight. meant I liked ending uh, we we ending on a positive note that we ended on the Mary this time. Oh, OK. It's a little negative oh. when we end on kills, but so thanks. Yeah, no problem. Glad that worked out. Uh, so hopefully this will also be a positive note. This is the scooter scale, the final segment of the show where we rate the episode on a scale of zero to five corn dogs in the honor of uh wienerlicious and its propri- proprietor scooter who wasn't in this episode but who's not in this episode was. just in aaron's fever dream of this episode yep um i'm gonna i'm gonna give it a 4.5 wow this, this is the season of aaron still and i know that has been a popular score for me i liked seeing uh casey as you said his emotions i liked seeing his backstory i think this was interesting and I like everything um, that it sets up. I think there's some interesting things that we talked about with Devin and Morgan both knowing, with Casey being a civilian, with Sarah potentially leaving, with Shaw off the board. I think a lot of interesting things are going on. 4.5 mm-hmm. corn dogs. Nice. I think I'm going to, I like this episode. I think I'm going to give it a four. I don't think it, I don't know. I feel like there was so much to that unraveled in this episode that it was hard for uh-huh. me to like process everything. And That's I wasn't, fair. I felt like it's setting up for a lot of crazy stuff to happen that I'm looking mm-hmm. forward to. But um, yeah, I think for I liked how it kind of felt like with the absence of Shaw and the return of Beckman, it felt like an earlier episode, like a season yeah. one or season two. Mm-hmm. It felt like a more it felt like a hybrid of Chuck versus the sensei and then Chuck versus the colonel in that it was kind of like they're sort of going against Casey. Oh, yeah. And but we're also learning about Casey's past, but I felt like this was a more elevated, smarter version of both Mm -hmm. those episodes because I felt like we actually learned about Casey and it was actually um, Casey's emotions at the forefront. And the action was great. I thought there were some really cool action sequences in this episode. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I think it was just kind of just a whole lot to process. That's 
Totally fair. Whole lots of process in one little tic tac. So we will leave you to process everything that we have just uh, passed on to you. That's right. Uh, <laughs> we will. We're now squarely in uh, the second half of season three. So we're going to be plugging away at season three and uh, looking forward to it. Aaron, thank you for being our guest on this episode. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for That's having me. Great guest. Maybe we can have you more as like a reoccurring. Oh, I would love that. Yeah. Just to have have my people talk to your people. OK, yeah, that'd be perfect. Uh, <laughs> my name is Chris Gillespie reminding you that Tic Tacs and food in general is sexy. Only the orange ones or just all of them? No, I think they're all kind of sexy. Are there other kinds? There's orange, there's white. I feel like there's a green I one. I don't know. All right, well, uh, we'll, we'll get TikToks. back to you on that. Uh, my <laughs> name is Aaron Arada, letting you know that anything is possible. Besides chewing gum or consuming Tic Tacs. Yeah. Strange, such a strange woman. Such a strange woman. That's me. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> See you next week. Thanks for listening. As always, a big thanks to the artist Hadakoa and the fine folks at freemusicarchive.org for providing us with our theme song, Warm Up. If you want to drop us a line, you can reach us at gocheckyourselfpodcast at gmail.com. Don't forget to like and subscribe to Go Check Yourself on your preferred podcast platform. New episodes come out every Monday morning and you do not want to miss a new episode. Thanks again. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye.